Rahm Emanuel is Chicago's next mayor, and some of our neighboring Democrats continue to hide out in Illinois. That's up next on Capitol View. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of Capitol View, the show where we talk about Illinois politics and government. I'm your host, Jamie Dunn, with Illinois Issues Magazine, and with me today is Kevin McDermott, State House reporter for uh, St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Kevin, thanks for coming. Okay. And Dave Dahl, State House reporter for the Illinois Radio Network. Dave, thanks for being here. Thank you. Well, in uh, what was a bit of maybe the most predictable news of the week, Rahm Emanuel did win the uh, election for mayor in Chicago. He got enough votes to avoid a runoff election. Um, so he's taking over for Mayor Daley, who has been the longest running mayor in Chicago. Uh, before that would be his dad was the longest running mayor. So what does this mean for Chicago? It's going to be some big changes. Dave, what do you think? Well, I agree. And one of the things he's probably going to do, talking about Rahm Emanuel, is get a new police chief. You know, it <coughs> appears that Jody Weiss will be taillights. But I think the question that we uh, ought to be asking is, uh, are you surprised at the amount of interest there is downstate? It seems that it's been in the downstate papers and TV and radio. Um, even though you wouldn't think it affects us all that much. But well, it, it, you got to remember it's national news too. I mean, they, they, uh, I, I heard about it on I think CNN. Uh, you know, because of his ties to President Obama, and also because of, uh, you know, just who he and his family, uh, who, you know, who he is and who his family is. Uh, this is. I think something that has some general interest in Chicago's, you know, uh, a world-class city and one of the, one of the one of the major cities in the country. What I can't understand is why anyone would want to be in charge of a major government today, with uh, <laughs> with the fiscal problems they have. It, it's uh, it seems like a no-win proposition, even if you win. Yeah, that's true. Uh, the Chicago Sun Times had a story this week on how he may be a one-term mayor because he has so many huge issues and unpopular decisions to make. Uh, there's a budget crisis in Chicago. Chicago public schools have some major issues. As Dave touched on, uh, their police chief is somewhat unpopular, and he may have to make a controversial decision there. Um, I, I think it'll be interesting to see who gets hired in the Emanuel administration. Because hasn't he tried to position himself as I'm not going to hire, you know, my family and friends, and it's not going to be all political, and we'll see if it's as as clear as as that. And uh, John Cass in the Tribune has said that uh, it's just it's almost like a rotation where one daily leaves, the other daily is chief of staff, a very powerful position in the White House, yeah. and the chief of staff becomes mayor to complete the circle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is kind of kind of an interesting oh. Illinois politics uh, gym there. And on his transition stuff, he does have a couple people who worked for Mayor Daley and uh, a couple people connected to the Obama administration. So we'll see what happens with the permanent staff. Another thing of note is that he will be the first uh, Jewish mayor of Chicago. So that's another thing that's made it national news. Another huge national news issue in the last couple of weeks have been the protests in Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin's Republican governor has uh, made some moves to strip unions of their bargaining rights. The people have uh, come out in mass in Madison, uh, very big protests, and 14 Democratic legislators have fled the state to uh, try to stall the vote and come over to Illinois. This happened last week. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of buzz in Illinois. People are kind of finding some novelty, well, some interest in this. And, and particularly now that the same situation or something like it is happening out of Indiana, we've got Indiana legislators uh, hiding out in Illinois. We're, we're sort of becoming the refugee for Democrats around the Midwest. Um, it. it uh, it's interesting to watch the Republicans here in Springfield trying to make some kind of hay out of this because obviously unlike our neighbors they're they're in the minority party and there there's not a whole lot they can do but we've already seen one bill at least one bill by a Republican in uh, in the house that that would do some of the kind of stuff that they're trying to do in Indiana and Wisconsin uh, from the Republican side to, to limit the power and the, and the collective bargaining rights of unions obviously that's not gonna have legs here but it uh, you know you, you really are seeing ideological uh, boundaries trumping state boundaries uh, to some extent between uh, between these three states. Apparently the rules of a quorum are a lot stricter in these other states than in Illinois mm -hmm. and if the Republicans were all to hightail it to you know maybe in a swap 
Maybe if the Republicans <laughs> would go to Lake Geneva <laughs> or St. Louis, the Democrats could still convene the legislature on their own. I, I asked one of our reporters in St. Louis, you know, is there is there any chance that Democrats there might might pull this? And she said, well, they could they could all fit on a very small bus and it wouldn't have any impact at all because there's so <laughs> few of them in, in Missouri. So, so the Republicans uh, that are coming out in Illinois and saying we're the minority party, but we would never do this. You know, we, mm -hmm. we wor we're going to work for solutions even if we don't like what's going on. That's that's a little hollow because they wouldn't sure. actually be able to pull off. The, the, the parties that, that's not in a position of having to do something unpopular always says it would never do it. And yeah. um, Another, I guess, interesting and sort of funny thing that's come out of this is, uh, is uh, a Republican representative, uh, Michael Tryon, has, has pitched an idea to actually tax their incomes while they're here in Illinois. Uh, probably not, not real feasible or... <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, 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 that's this kind of partisan, you know, back and forth and trying to get their points in. He's, he's, he's a Republican. He's the same one who filed the bill that I talked about earlier. Um, that, you know, again, they're trying to get their, trying to get something uh, on the board from Illinois Republicans, but I don't think they're going to get much of the national attention that their uh, Democratic <laughs> visitors are getting here. He mentioned the Green Bay Packers, and that's become somewhat in vogue to tax players on visiting pro teams yeah. uh, to try to try to cull some income that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, he made it kind of a smart aleck remark on the floor about it, uh, but obviously that's not going anywhere as a lot of things aren't going anywhere. Certainly the Illinois Republicans aren't going anywhere, but good old Illinois. <laughs> well, all joking aside, this has become a really big national issue. Uh, a lot of states are looking to uh, Wisconsin and, and Indiana to see w what happens because states are looking to close their budget gaps, and in some cases they're targeting state workers and unions for cuts. This is happening to some degree in Illinois. I mean, it's never probably going to go as far as mm. it's as it's going in our neighboring states because we have Democrats in charge. But there are some things that are on the table. Uh, pensions. Well, we, yeah, we've, I mean, the, the governor and the legislature has already um, changed the pension system so it's less generous for incoming employees. And there's, there's just this kind of constant drumbeat of, well, we need to do more of this for the existing employees. And that's where you get into the real fight. The fact that, that these things are happening even under Democratic power structure here tells you how serious they are about trying to, trying to trim money from that part of the budget because pensions and everything to do with unions, is, you know, it's a lot of money. The reality is when you go to work for a General Motors or other for-profit employer, uh, you sign on at age 18 or whatever and then, uh, you know, 40 or 45 years later you leave and they give you a gold watch and a healthy pension for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. It's not like that anymore in the private sector and the, the people that are saying oh, we ought to run government as a business at yeah. least uh, in terms of public employment, uh, the money's not there. Well, I have to full disclosure, I am a public employee, so this affects me in some ways. But uh, the flip side argument there, I think, is, is that public sector jobs sometimes don't pay as much. People mm -hmm. sign on for the security. You know, that some of these fringe benefits are, are sort of assumed to be part of, part of the job. But um, looking at what other states are doing, is this going to help some of the Democrats in Illinois say, hey, at least we're not Wisconsin, at least we're not Indiana, yeah, look, you know, yeah, if they you look don't like it. progressive by <laughs> comparison. Of course, you know, it's, from what's going on in Wisconsin, it's hard not to look progressive by comparison, I guess. But, uh, it, yeah, it's interesting how it sort of ginned up the whole partisan divide uh, throughout the country. Uh, w one of the, one of the uh, statements that was made when the news about the Indiana legislators uh, came out was that they needed to go to a state that had a Democratic governor so that... They, they could count on the police in that state not hauling them back to their own state. So we, we're down to the point where they're actually looking at the party of the governor and going to that state based on that. State so police is, or yeah. National Guard. Go, yeah. Would that really happen? I mean, that would be hilarious. Yeah, it's, um, it's getting a little strange. They may have looked to Illinois d due to our cuts. We don't really have the people to send yeah. out to haul them back right now. We have other anyway things to do. certainly <laughs> undercut Illinois standing as one of the goofiest states in the union. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're, we're now a safe harbor for other states minority party. Well, and just kind of a, a, a funny historical note that I found uh, on Congressional Quarterly today. Lincoln actually uh, fled, fled a vote. He didn't leave the state. He just left the state house. There's some reports that he may have jumped out of a window, but that hasn't been confirmed in order to, to avoid a, a vote having to do with the state bank, um, but he was brought back and, and had to vote soon thereafter. Uh, one of the other... So this isn't unprecedented, okay, Lincoln. <laughs> yes, yes, Lincoln did it. Uh, one of the other uh, uh, big 
issues. This week has been uh, Governor Quinn's proposed cuts to addiction treatment services. Kevin, you said you've been talking to some providers. Yeah, we. In your uh, area. Yeah, this has been a this has been a shock. Well, he's already announced that he's going to cut uh, cut completely cut state funding uh, for drug drug addiction substance abuse uh, treatment in the next fiscal year and then and then uh, last week you said well we're actually going to start cutting it almost immediately we're going to start cutting it in march um and uh, we talked to some providers in in our area and almost universally what they said was you know you're gonna you're gonna end up spending 10 times as much by doing this because drug addicts who are trying to get treatment and can't are going to end up in hospitals or prison and the, the expense ultimately is going to be a lot more and if it's hospitals and, and local jails and other things associated with local communities you have these these expenses being pushed from the state onto local governments, which has become sort of a pattern uh, with the Quinn administration lately. And the governor slipped the word, as I understand it, to department directors on a Friday. Very late in the day. Yeah. Didn't you know there was no word from the governor's office? There was no yeah. news release. Well, and then it got and then on, on Tuesday, they the providers were all expecting a letter to see how much each of them was actually going to lose because they've got a mix of federal and state money and nobody's, you know, most of them aren't really sure how this is mm -hmm. going to affect their budgets. And then the letter didn't come and then they told them it was on hold. So in addition to the fact that they're going to lose all this money, there's some confusion about where exactly it's going to leave them. It's, um, they're, 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 I've never seen this segment of the state quite this up in arms and we talk to these folks occasionally. And some of the concern that they're having too is that they might lose some federal funds if the maintenance of effort right. is not put Well, they're, uh, they're not, yeah, that's another thing. I mean, what, what the administration, what Quinn's administration has said is well, we're still going to pass through the federal money, but there may, may not be federal money if it turns out that by not matching that money, you're going to lose those funds. And there's still some question as to whether that's going to happen, but the providers seem to think it's a danger. I went to an event with uh, Sheila Simon as the keynote speaker and talking mm -hmm. about what a great relationship she had with Governor Quinn, especially because when Quinn was lieutenant governor, he didn't have all that great relationship with that governor. Mm -hmm. And afterward, I, I said, well, what about these cuts? And you could argue that it's a bad idea mm -hmm. and the governor's handled it badly. And she said, well, I'm still trying to digest what it all means and what, what impact it's going to be on, on these providers. So it, it's clear that she wasn't necessarily real close to the decision on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it seems that uh, Quinn's being pretty mum on it. I, I haven't gotten any response from, from well, any of his office. He did touch on it yesterday in Chicago, mm -hmm. but he, he would not confirm that this was the level of cuts. He yeah. was very vague and said, we need to talk about it. So there may be some possibility for negotiation. Well, there's been a little, there's been a sense of backpedaling. When I told you a minute ago about the letter, uh, struck everybody as very strange. I mean, when you, when, when you are a state agency and you are a state government, you tell these agencies you're getting a letter on such and such date, plan on planning accordingly, and then all of a sudden it doesn't come, and then all of a sudden they're saying, well, wait, we're going to rethink this. It, it makes you wonder, I mean, a, lo a lot of, several newspapers, including mine, had already editorialized against this thing by this point, mm -hmm. and it makes you wonder if maybe they're, they're thinking twice about this. They're, they're, they're frequently you hear arguments against cuts which, which follow the lines of, by cutting this, you're going to cost more. And frequently it's nonsense. In this case, it seems to be true. I mean, you, these people are going to go, these, these you know, people who need drug substance abuse services are going to, they're, they're not just going to be okay because mm -hmm. they're not getting the service. Something's going to happen. Well, and, and the cuts yeah, are almost gonna, immediately, immediately by the way. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, well, I felt that they, some of the providers had a press conference the other day, and <laughs> there's often this doom and gloom kind of, kind of screaming from the rafters when there's cuts. Mm -hmm. I felt like this had a, in the short time I've been here, had a little bit of a different feel that they were saying, we're closing our doors Friday for yeah. this service. We are laying off this number of people right. in two weeks. Mm -hmm. I mean, they had some very concrete, concrete numbers of what will happen if these cuts become a reality. Yeah. So d is Quinn doing this to create this ruckus, to no, show well, people that these cuts are not uh, politically that, viable? That would, be, well, that would be a pretty interesting strategy, <laughs> but I, I wasn't, I'm not getting the sense that there's a real strategy. I mean, I think basically they, they looked at this as an amount of money that, and, and it's not a huge amount. I don't remember off the top of my head what kind of money we're talking about, but it's not, it's, 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 it's not going to solve uh, any of these problems. And, um, you know, no, I, I, th I think basically they were looking at this as something that maybe wouldn't get that much notice. Uh, it might be a little cynical, but they might be saying, well, you know, what, what percentage of voters and news watchers out there are drug addicts? Well, yeah. maybe, maybe not that many, but it, it has gotten quite According a bit to attention. the service providers, their number was one in every four households. But yeah. um. In the governor's budget <laughs> speech last week, I don't recall the part where he said, in two days, I'm going to cut all this. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. He did propose similar cuts to this for the next, next fiscal, uh, year, fiscal right. year, but those would be debated in the General Assembly, mm -hmm. and it would be a while, and they probably wouldn't come out exactly like 
he proposed them. Basically, the cuts would, would uh, mean that the state would no longer provide funding for people for drug addiction services unless they're on Medicaid, unless they get right. that federal match of dollars, which, according to the service providers, is somewhere around 80% of the yeah. people that they serve. And, it's, and, the, and, and the, uh, the, the Medicaid dollars are, are mostly going, I mean, the, the large percentage are, are two women, single mothers, kids. And so you've got a lot of you know young adult males out there who ultimately could be the most expensive if they're you know if they're involved in crimes and and that's one of the arguments that the providers are making. Well, moving along to an issue that's related to crimes, uh, there's a lot of gun bills also going through the General Assembly right mm -hmm. now, going through committee. Kevin, you've been following this quite a yeah, bit. Yeah, it's give us um, an update? We, we, there is an annual crop of these things obviously that come up. Uh, it's it seems to be greater this year, and everybody on both sides of the issue agrees that what we're looking at here is sort of a, uh, um, a, a boost to this whole perennial issue because of the a couple of recent U.S. Supreme Court cases, which, um, and I think we've talked about this a lot on the show before, but this has been developing since then, um, which uh, essentially have, have uh, restricted local government's uh, ability to restrict guns. And, uh, the, you know, the long and short of it is that most gun control that, that does go on in this state is at the, is at the local level. You, have, you know, you had Chicago with this law, and you had Oak Park, and you had some other municipalities. Um, the gun bills basically are coming into two categories. One that would um, uh, allow concealed carry. Illinois is one of only two states that doesn't do that uh, currently. And then, and then the other would, in a more general sense, prevent local municipalities from passing uh, any law that's more stringent than state law when it comes to gun laws. This is something that's, that's meant to be more of a catch-all to prevent not just local laws stopping concealed carry, but to, to stop other things as well. It's going to be an inter interesting battle. We've had years in the past where there's been a lot of gun bills filed and nothing ever went anywhere and they sort of stopped talking about it. The sense this year is that uh, this is going to be a front burner issue before this is all over. Well, it seems like that city bill is sort of trying to fill the gap that was left open by the Supreme Court. Yeah, the ruling. Supreme Court didn't actually say you can't do any local ordinances against gun bills. What it, what it essentially uh, said is that uh, there, there is a Second Amendment right to own a gun, and so uh, y any law that you have has to be within, you know, with that in mind, and it has to adhere to that. Um, mostly it had to do with guns in the home, so the, the concealed carry issue is not strictly in line with that, so that's going to be a big point of argument. I mean, the people who are in favor of gun control are, are essentially saying, look, those Supreme Court cases, not only do they not give you concealed carry, but they actually, you know, reinforce that we can have some kind of laws here. There's just some debate as to what they're going to say. And these bills, as you said, come up session after session. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of pushback from Chicago, clearly, yeah, on these. Dave, what do you think um, might be different this time around? Or are we here in the same old tune that we hear every year? Uh, it might be the latter, uh, partly because the uh, Republicans didn't gain a lot of ground. Uh, I, I don't think the arguments are any different, but the bills do seem to be the same. And what I find amusing is that uh, Illinois is one of two states that doesn't have concealed carry. The other one is Wisconsin, which has open, open carry. carry. Yeah. So <laughs> arguably more of the carry. Yeah. With the if you assume everybody, if you assume everybody's packing, uh, yeah. I, I guess that's the way to go. <laughs> well, Dave, uh, you covered today another uh, sort of criminal justice issue. There's a, a bill dealing with sex offenders that went through committee this morning. Uh, it, another issue that's been around for quite a while. Can you summarize for us? The Romeo bit? and Juliet bill, what they want to do is uh, not have a, for example, a 17-year-old boy who has a girlfriend who is 15. They don't want that sort of situation to be the same as a dangerous sexual predator and so uh, in those cases they would uh, uh, that individual would not have to register as a sex offender. Or be able to make the argument that he shouldn't have to register. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Exactly and these sex offenders I mean I, no one's going to champion a criminal cause certainly not me mm -hmm. but look at all the things you can't do you can't live here you can't live there you can't drive a school bus, you can't drive an ice cream truck, you can't drive a fire engine because fire engines often go to schools. Uh, and and the, there are so many restrictions, you almost feel that, well, maybe, the, maybe they ought to just get life in prison. Well, and the interesting thing about this bill is that every year we have, again, a whole crop of sex offender bills, but virtually all of them are toughening these rules. Mm -hmm. and the rules that Dave's talking about get tougher every year. Uh, this is the first one I can remember seeing that would loosen it. Um, this year as well, just out of curiosity, we went and looked, and sure enough, you know, there's a there's a half dozen or more 
uh, serious bills out there that would tighten restrictions. One of them would make the whole sex offender registration list retroactive. Mm -hmm. So even people who were convicted and did their time before there was a sex offender registration list would have to now come in and put their names on that list. That's my point. Have yeah. you ever really done your time if you're going to have this lifetime registry? And, and some of the restrictions, uh, you know, they, they sound pretty extreme. And if that's how it's going to be, as I said, maybe, maybe they ought to revisit the system of correcting it. Well, and the, these restrictive bills are, are, as we said, popular every year. Yeah. Uh, some of them, you wonder if they come out of a genesis of anything that, that was a problem in real life. Not to say that there shouldn't be some limits, but some of them, you do kind of wonder, where does that come from? Well, and part of the problem is it's very difficult for legislators to vote against these bills right. because then they can, they, their opponents would say, you know, they're soft on crime, on sex offense. In fact, mm -hmm. it was a fellow from the Metro East area. I think he committed the crime in Bethalto and he lives in Fairview Heights now and said, I want to go to college to be an automotive technician and I can't go to college because there might be high school kids there mm -hmm. at taking a college class. And when you talk about wanting to rehabilitate people and correct people, and here's someone whose crime was being involved with, uh, I think she was 15 or 16, I guess she'd been 15, mm -hmm. year old girl whose dad wanted uh, to press charges. Mm -hmm. The girl's under the age of consent and uh, now he's on the sex offender registry and he can't go to college. Now, under this bill, would they still be able to face charges, but then after penalties, just not? They yeah, would my be able understanding to is it wouldn't change what's a crime. It okay. would change who has to be on the registry, because the registry is kind of the issue. You, you, have, you have a two-tier thing. You, you have a crime that's committed, and the person is sentenced to probation or prison or whatever, and then after the sentence is over, this person's name is still on that list where anybody can look at it. It's the name on the list that's the issue here. I don't think it's changing the... Uh, statutory. It's a matter so of, uh, yes, separating that uh, yeah. uh, that young man from someone who is a danger to society. Right. Well, and it seems the list that we have now, uh, they have a lot of difficulty maintaining it, um, so it might be appropriate to go after people that are established as dangerous. But the other thing that makes it difficult is this would mean sort of looking at it on a case-by-case -case basis, which people might be able to claim inequity or say that they were being treated unfairly. Sure. Um, what's some of the opposition to this bill, Dave? That the crime is the crime. And uh, there's some of the prosecutors that say, uh, you know, we don't want to weaken it. Well, moving on to another pretty controversial topic. Um, the civil unions uh, bill, which was signed into law, will go into effect in June. So same-sex couples as well as uh, heterosexual couples will be able to get civil unions at that time. And there is a couple from central Illinois, actually mm -hmm. from my hometown of Mattoon, that is looking for a place to have their ceremony and they're running into some difficulties. Right, yeah, this was a story that, that broke in, uh, well, we and the, the Post-Dispatch and the Sun-Times both had, and I think it's out there now. Uh, a couple, uh, this couple called uh, two different uh, bed and breakfasts and what they were looking for was a place where they could have their civil ceremony after it goes into effect in June. Uh, both places turned them down. One place turned them down and sort of politely said we don't we don't do those sorts of ceremonies and there was some question as to whether they do that place was in Alton. The other mm -hmm. place was uh, in, near Kankakee and they sent back an email essentially saying we don't believe in your lifestyle and we don't care if this is a law and if it is we're not going to follow it. Uh, I think those folks probably have their lawyers pulling their hair out at this point. Uh, they have filed a complaint not under the new law that, that uh, is going into effect in June, but the existing Human Rights Act in Illinois already uh, categorizes uh, sexual orientation in the same way you would race. It'd be the same thing from an Illinois legal standpoint as turning down a, a black couple uh, mm -hmm. because you know you because we don't want to have your wedding here. You're not allowed to do that uh, under Illinois law. Under federal law, you're not allowed to do that either. Although the feds don't have the protection of uh, uh, sexual or orientation that we do in Illinois. So um, it's, you know, it's not quite a test case. Some of this stuff has been out there before, but I think there's more attention being given to it because of the, the civil union um, thing. So you know, it's a case that we'll be watching. You would think that if you're in the kind of business of running an inn or motel or whatever, that you uh, give up a little bit of the ability to choose your customers. That, that's, well, that's certainly the, the, the status of the law. I mean, it essentially says if you, are, if you are not a private club, if you're offering this you know, service to the whole world. You have to offer it to the whole world. You have to offer it to the whole world. You can't just pick and choose and, and discriminate based on this list of things. And, and in Illinois, again, sexual orientation is on the list. Now, I thought I read uh, something about there being some exemptions. There uh, are some exemptions. Uh, they apparently 
I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but I, I don't think anybody's claiming the exemptions apply in this case. I mean, it, uh, for example, uh, if you are a, a religious institution, you're not required to, to host a same-sex uh, marriage or, or participate in any way in that. Uh, if it's against your religious beliefs, um, these are secular businesses, as far as I know. So that, that doesn't come into play. And, there, and there's a few other things having to do with uh, if it's lodging, having to do with the size of the place, but this is a ceremony, so they weren't talking about lodging. Um, but, uh, you know, that'll be for the lawyers to hash out whether there's any exemptions that work in here. The, the letter that was written by the one bed and breakfast, uh, or, or the email that was written, essentially uh, said bluntly, you know, we just, we don't like your lifestyle, we think it's against the Bible, and um, there's no way we're going to do this for you, and we don't care what the law is. So, if there's a test case, that may be it right there, because mm -hmm. there's no question as to why they're why they're doing this. Well, and um, I, I spoke with some LGBT legal experts right after the Civil Unions bill passed, and they talked about that they were predicting some situations like this, that there might be some, some uh, local officials that refuse people certificates mm -hmm. to try to challenge the law, that this may be the first in a, in a line of, of some legal issues that come yeah, out of this. Um, something that came out today uh, that has been making news, it's all over Twitter, is that Senator Ricky Hinden has uh, announced he's retiring from the Illinois Senate. He's been a really colorful personality in the yeah. Senate for quite a few years. Uh, just here in the last minute or so of the show, can you give me some of your impressions of him over the years and uh, what his role was in the General Assembly? One of them goes a long way. <laughs> <laughs> he always kept things interesting. Yes, yeah, yeah. And um, a footnote to history, uh, supposedly almost got into a fist fight with Obama. Exactly. He was, yeah, he almost got into a fist fight with Obama on, on the Senate floor over Bill. That, that was... Uh, part of this one of the stories and oh. have we seen the last of them I, I guess it, it will come to see he has run fairly often for other offices in Illinois so mm -hmm. we may not have seen the last of him but we'll have to end on that note I'd like to thank my guests for coming today Kevin McDermott from the St. Louis Post Dispatch and Dave Dahl from Illinois Radio Network I'm your host Jamie Dunn with Illinois Issues magazine please tune in next week and also check out our Facebook page by searching Capital View on Facebook thank you